Hello and welcome to the Security Token Show, everyone. It's Monday. It's another week of big tokenization news. We're your hosts. I'm Herbert Konings, joined as always by my business partner, Kyle Sondland. And we are excited to dive in with yet another round of amazing uh, financing updates, Kyle. A lot of new tokenization issuances, a lot of new platforms coming to market. It's a big week. How are oh, you? Oh, yeah, it is. You better believe it. And the cool thing about this industry is that we're tying together technology with the different blockchain solutions, with traditional finance and all the different fundraising announcements and financial structures. Then, of course, there's this level of innovation with interjurisdictional you know, relationships and all kinds of transactions that are occurring from banks and countries all around the world working together to drive the innovation of finance. And you learn it all here on the Security Token Show. This is episode 221. Ooh. That feels good to that's say. A lot of episodes, Kyle. And that's because we're coming on to five years this year, five years of doing the show. Can't wait to celebrate that milestone. But first, we got to get into the news. Let's start with the token debrief. And as always, we have our guest contributor this week, once again, Jason Barraza from the STM team. How are you today, Jason? Doing great. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, lots of news to cover from all over the world. Um, I know it's a very packed episode, so without further ado, let's jump in. Yeah, so packed that we can't really get through every single article because I think the show would last two hours, and I'm not sure that everybody wants it to last two hours. So with that, you know, we all came together and did a little bit of research, uh, and uh, let's see what you guys want to talk about out of my section. I got some some updates here, starting with Figure, uh, who announced actually that they are uh, going to be launching a stable coin. So payments, P-Y-M-N-T-S dot com. They actually reported this uh, and actually found out that back in October, Figure actually applied to the U.S. regulators, to the SEC, in order to be able to issue an interest bearing stable coin, unlike USDC and Tether. Uh, but because it is, of course, uh, going to accrue interest daily and they plan to distribute it monthly to the holders, as a result of that, it does make it automatically a, a security, of course. And that's why, of course, I assume they're seeking approval from the SEC. The interest, for anyone who's curious, I know Kyle is for sure, will be derived from reserves that include the Treasury, commercial paper, corporate debt, and other assets. Very cool news. We also saw out of Switzerland, Taurus, which is actually backed by the Deutsche, Deutsche Bank. Um, they got approved by FINMA. That's the SEC. That's the, the regulator over in Switzerland. And they have approved Taurus to allow retail trading with their tokenized securities. So that means any investor, professional or retail, can now take advantage of Taurus's platform. That's their TDX their trading marketplace in order to take advantage of the tokenized assets that they have. And they actually love their quote. They say, our core belief at Taurus is that private markets 2.0 shall be digitized so that buying a private security becomes as easy as buying a book on Amazon. Uh, very, very cool. Uh, next, we also saw Invenium. They partner with Providence, which figure also uh, is behind. Uh, and they claim that within just the last month, after through their partnership, they've already uh, ledgered $4.5 billion in private asset validation data. So, of course, Invenium is one of the leading companies in the space, acting as a sort of oracle provider to work with RWAs with tokenized securities and act as a third party valuation agent, not actually as a valuation provider. They typically work with, I believe, Cushman and Wakefield and many others, but they go ahead and pass and stamp that uh, valuation data onto the security token so that you can tie the two together, something very important for all kinds of calculations. And then we actually saw over in Hong Kong to end my section with the SFC, the regulators are there saying their three-year plan through 2026, uh, focusing on market resilience and global finance innovation. And their big things are market integrity, control, and efficiency, which is, of course, why they included tokenization 
as part of that roadmap. If you're curious, you can go check that out. Uh, and actually, last but not least, is actually the biggest news of all. Signum, I think, uh, raised $40 million. They actually say that that was beyond their $35 million target to close their strategic growth round at a valuation of $900 million. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Signum has been in the space quite some time. Uh, and they actually closed last year with $100 million, they claim, in annualized revenue run rate and achieved positive cash flow in Q4. Always a strong sign for a startup. Uh, worth noting that Azimut Holdings, who we've heard of on the show in the past, was the lead investor in this round. Guys, a lot of great headlines here. Which one do you want to tackle? I really love the stablecoin angle. You were spot on in picking that that was kind of where – my mind immediately went. I think that this has been, you know, I think Nick Carter has said this and, and many other thought leaders in the space have really talked about how stable coins are the killer app for crypto and have really demonstrated a significant use case, a significant value add to the transactional economy. And we're continuing to see more and more issuers launching stable coins for their internal payment platforms Obviously, this comes with risk with respect to making sure that these reserves are fully backed, making sure that these things are transparent. Um, but I think it makes total sense for Figure to do this. I think that it presents them with a lot of potential leverage within their already transactional economy. It allows them to potentially scale that opportunity by you know, capitalizing on seniorage as well as the float there. So I think there's a lot of interesting things to unpack. I'm excited to see how this adoption happens Potentially externally as well. We know how it might be useful as a, a unit of account within their own transactions, but will their outside vendors and counterparties look to leverage this as well? Or will they see that as a liability? How will you risk manage those different types of things? I think it presents some really interesting problems and potential opportunities for, for the, the greater ecosystem to start kind of chewing on. Totally, totally agree. Uh, this is also a, a hot topic because it lends into CBDCs in, in general. You know, the, I think that brings up uh, a lot of interest regarding adoption. But the fact that it's interest bearing uh, might be interesting, might be a differentiator that helps kind of shoot them up to the top. Uh, it is it is kind of curious, I, I will say. Um you know, if they actually will get adoption from call it the crypto crowd or the DeFi community, because they tend to focus on institutions, they tend to work with a lot of banks. Uh, and so I think we'll probably end up seeing a lot more adoption from that side than we do kind of the mainstream use cases. Jason, anything from my list of articles that stood out to you? Absolutely. Before I dive into that one, just quick note on figure. I saw that they, you know, registered um, just last month, right, and they're uh, essentially noting these as face amount certificates, which is basically a fixed income type of security. Um, and really interesting point there is that they, instead of dollar pegged, which is what we see with other stable coins, they'll actually be penny pegged. Um, so each one will be a penny. So again, just a little differentiator, but you guys made a lot of great points there. The other one that, of your list, Herbert, that I really like was Taurus. Taurus getting retail investors alongside the institutional that they already get to serve service um and so this announcement does come with a new platform my tdx trading i think is what they're calling it and so they already have a few clients that are onboarding uh to be able to offer those tokenized securities again to both retail and institutional players um so again just another great uh you know license and approval coming on from that side of the world over in switzerland totally makes sense I agree. Very exciting stuff, guys. And I have some articles that I've been looking at that maybe I can help transition into to some of the other Ooh. additional things we've got going. Yeah. So first off, for me, Chainlink has actually fully upgraded and integrated into the base blockchain. And so we've talked about base quite a bit. This is, is the Ethereum scalable layer two solution built by Coinbase to leverage across all of their different products, which they are sorely needing, especially with the ETFs and the reduction in profitability for trading that they've seen because of it. And Chainlink, if you're unfamiliar, is one of the leading, if not the surefire leading data oracle for on-chain transactions and activity across all different types of blockchains. And they present that, that bridge for any different 
protocol, any type of lending, leverage, any type of derivative platform to have a pricing oracle of what's going on in the space. They've now integrated with the Coinbase blockchain. And this presents a key opportunity for a lot of that cross-chain application. We see so many different security tokens that have already been issued on Ethereum or on Solana or on a variety of different blockchains that that have been covered here on the show that are proprietary or not. And so having that chain link bridge to communicate the data more effectively is a really key point of adoption. We certainly here at STM know the value of having high quality trusted data. Chainlink provides that for the, the blockchain space and a lot of the on-chain transactions. I think that is really, really important for the development and interoperability of tokenized offerings, which we talk about so much, especially with security tokens, where you really care more about the actual investment asset than you do the blockchain. So having a blockchain solution that is you know, transferable is, is the most important part. Number two, I've got Elwood Technologies, which is supported by Goldman Sachs and led by Alan Howard, has actually received their authorization from the FCA in the UK to offer security token and derivatives trading. So they are facilitating connections between crypto exchanges, as well as OTC trading venues. And Elwood actually completed a $70 million Series A in May 2022 to actually launch these products. We've seen a lot of great development from the UK with Archax providing primary and potentially secondary offerings. Now we have Elwood that's coming into the game as well and potentially offering derivatives trading, which we've talked about on the show before, is so important for potentially doing market making. So that's fascinating to see the developments there. And we have a lot of different developments across the industry, but great to see Elwood crushing it. I gotta tell you, Kyle, that, sorry to interrupt you in your, your role there, but that's huge news. Uh, $70 million Series A from a couple of years ago. Now they're finally in the market. They're looking at you know, derivatives as well are backed by Goldman Sachs. You know, like this is a very, very real uh, article or approval, I should say, uh, that I, I hope it doesn't go unnoticed. I think people will start to see them come to market very soon. Yeah, I mean, Alan Howard from Elwood now was the former CEO of Brevin Howard. So that was a hedge fund. So they have a lot of experience in making plays in this space. And this is the type of institutional party that I think the industry really needs to drive liquidity in these markets. On top of just bringing good products to market, we need to be having in those players that are actually going to be facilitating the trading and, and creating a more realistic opportunity for investors. That, at least from my experience, has been one of the biggest concerns or, or barriers to entry for a lot of traditional investors is just that there doesn't seem to be a ton of activity. And so we need to bring in these types of intermediary players to help drive that liquidity into the market. And quick other note on Alan Howard. I mean, he has a foot in multiple tokenization uh, you know, ventures, if you will, at this point. We just covered him a couple, covered Robin Howard specifically a couple of episodes ago, uh, issuing on Libre, which is the new one, uh, the new platform launched by both them and Nomura. So congrats to Alan Howard there. What we're thinking. Absolutely. And so I got two more guys to keep going on this, this path here. Keep my momentum running. We've got the Bank of International Settlements announced its 2024 program to continue CBDC testing, this time focusing a little bit more on privacy because there's been a large international really? discussion around, uh, you know, surveillance state style of transactional systems. But as we know, if it comes from central banks, you know, that privacy word who knows if it's actually private or if it's if it's something you could kind of work around but either way they're also doing blockchain based tokenization projects and some other financial innovations all of this is under project promisa which is a collaboration between the bank of international settlements as well as a swiss national bank and the world bank where they're also building a digital tokenized platform doing the promissory notes and paper backed financial instruments which we've now seen for probably two years now of, of people leveraging and companies leveraging promissory notes, all kinds of, of small market funds, treasury bills, all these types of things do seem to be the first step for a lot of these issuers in dipping their toe into the tokenization space, presumably because they are the most liquid assets and they're 
not super risky. So there's not a lot of, of counterparty risk with respect to the underlying investment. And there seems to be pretty healthy demand. So they're testing out the technology while keeping the, the financial instrument relatively consistent. As well, the BIS has Project Orem, which is a in partnership with the Hong Kong Monetary Authority to do retail payments using CBDCs. So that will be very interesting to see. As we know from the APAC region, they're very forward focused on digital currencies and payments, but it's not incredibly private. And in 2024, they're also going to be bringing six additional projects to market, including cybersecurity, financial crime, green finance, and tokenization, as well as stablecoin regulation and cross-border payments. So there is so much going on here. The Bank of International Settlements is not playing around. It, at this point, it seems like a foregone conclusion that they totally see the value of blockchain and tokenization inside of the financial system. And now it's more about figuring out exactly where they should focus their efforts. So this is, you know, they're not necessarily saying this, and I don't think that this is a, a you know, specific event that signifies that, but we've certainly transitioned from let's research to see if blockchain is valuable to, all right, blockchain's definitely valuable. Where are we <laughs> going to get the most opportunity from it? So great to see the BIS. And before I open it up to the floor, guys, I have one more, and then I want to hear your thoughts on these two. And this is just about Solana. Solana is integrating and upgrading some of their extensions that allow for more customizable and enterprise applications of tokenization. We've talked about this with Ethereum in the past. The original token, the ERC-20, didn't carry any metadata or permissions or things like that that you would totally need if you were going to bring real-world assets onto the blockchain. This is now Solana's first effort in bringing a lot of those solutions to market. You can do compliance checks, you can have confidentiality, you can do zero knowledge proofs for privacy, and you can allow interest accrual on those particular tokens. So very cool to see that they're adding some of these modular extensions to their blockchain, um, which we've seen all different types of blockchains solve in different ways. Solana doing it through extensions. So gentlemen, anything else that you wanna comment on and uh, what caught your fancy? Love Solana. Love to see uh, yet another huge public blockchain focusing on tokenization. I think we've seen some issuances in the past already, uh, but naturally, I think everybody's realizing that the growth in RWAs and the taking advantage of the tokenization trend is not going to come from the retail uh, crowd or even focusing on startups. Uh, they, they recognize, just like everybody else, really, that enterprises are the ones that are moving the needle. You said it so eloquently. Uh, through the BIS, Kyle, that I think most of Wall Street has recognized uh, tokenization is here. It's going to change the way the the whole financial system works. It makes things better, more efficient, more transparent. Heck, Larry Fink thinks it's going to end corruption. <laughs> uh, so I think it's just great to see, you know, once again, whenever you see these major chains uh, move towards tokenization, it signals a trend for RWAs. It signals to other blockchains that they should be looking at this. Uh, and it puts another option out into the space, offering more competitive blockchain solutions for issuers uh, is always a good thing, I think. Absolutely. I really like the BIS news, guys. I mean, it looks like they have a lot going out with the two, Project Promisa and Project Arun that you mentioned, Kyle, but they have a whole other suite of projects. It makes me think uh, similar to Project Guardian over in, in the APEC region, right, and what they're doing. I'm, you know, Late last year, we saw them come out with multiple uh, findings and whatnot and announcements. I'm curious to see what BIS will be doing this year um, as we dive in deeper into other the other projects that they're experimenting with. Totally. And yeah, go ahead. No, I'm just going to say I totally agree with your perspective and fire away. Give me your, your news headlines, Jason. Absolutely. Well, first on my list here, we have R3. This was R3 was launched originally by a nine bank consortium, and they are now coming with R3 digital markets, actually a platform for DLT uh, and specifically at capital markets. Interesting timing here. Um, because they will be supporting digital assets as well as digital currencies um, on the digital asset side. So for security tokens, they're talking about issuance, listing, trading, and custody, as well as interoperability. Interesting timing with the UK launching their digital security sandbox this month and the European Central Bank 
also starting their trials with central bank money on DLT settlements. So both of those are great timing for Corda. Um, and as we know from previous coverage, Corda is already integrated with other uh, platforms in the uh, ecosystem, such as SDX, uh, uh, Progmat in Japan, as well as uh, Euroclear's digital uh, financial markets uh, institu uh, you know, institutional uh, platform. So that's R3. We then also have Ondo. Ondo Finance will be expanding to APAC. Essentially, um, there is more demand in the APAC region for US-based assets, and Ondo Finance is the one that we've covered in the past, famously for the USG uh, offering, essentially providing exposure to US treasuries, as well as a couple others, such as the OMMF, the same thing, but for US money market funds. And most lately, we saw USDY, which is a yield bearing uh, alternative to stable coins. And so for the APAC region, they are announcing that they have appointed Ashwin Kosha as their vice president of business development for that region. He's based out of Hong Kong. And he comes with 10 years of institutional business development guys with experience from Citi, Tether, Bitfinex, and a few others. Wow. Any thoughts on these couple pieces? No, I think it's all great. Uh, a big deal regarding um, I think uh, R3, they've been a, a big player in the past working with enterprises. I literally just said how important enterprises are to tokenization. So maybe they've got a bit of a leg leg up or a head start with them, given the potential relationships they've already created. We know that public blockchains, though I think we all agree, are the future, that permissioned and even not even using a blockchain as a traditional distributed ledger system, in some cases for certain very risk averse institutions, uh, is the way to get started into this ecosystem. So uh, excited to see R3 kind of refocus on this technology. Yeah, I agree. And I think on the other side, you know, Ando has done a good job of building some of these treasury notes and tokenized offerings. It's going to be interesting to see with all this increased competition if, you know, how competitive those products will continue to be. We already know that, especially with treasury stuff, there's not a lot of yield there. So there's not a lot of, of margin for some of these issuers to be able to, to capitalize on to pay for all of the expenses. So as some of these larger institutions come and offer these competitive products, even if it's at the same rates or the same yields, it does make it more difficult for some of these startups to provide the same services. So you look at Ondo, you look at Maple, you look at a lot of these kind of more you know, startup style of issuers that are offering similar products to some of the big boys. It, it'll be something to watch to see how they're able to adjust, adapt and survive. Well, guys, that was a heck of a news segment, and we couldn't even get through every article in detail uh, the way we want to. I love talking to tokenization about you guys, but uh, at the end of the day, we only have so much time. I think it's a great thing to see this much news coming out every week. I don't think it's going to stop. Uh, so any feedback from anybody who's listening or watching, we're always happy to hear it on how you'd like to hear the news. But with that, uh, that is the end of the token debrief. I think we can move on to the next segment. Well, we saw a lot of uh, industry activity, but did we have a lot of market activity this week? I think so. We've got a couple of headlines to get through. I'm going to start it out with a bond tokenization, folks. Everyone's talking about treasury securitizations. Don't sleep on the bonds. They've been happening mm -hmm. for quite a while. And this is the first out of Hong Kong. Uh, that I know of using the latest regime uh, that we saw get issued by uh, the Hong Kong regulators just last year. Uh, and this is by a company called GF Securities. Uh, and so they say they've achieved a significant milestone by issuing these fully digitized bonds uh, using ABT Tech Limited, uh, their technology for real world asset tokenization. Uh, they say that their platform is tailored between security and flexibility. 
uh, because of regulated securities, the system integrates a robust on-chain governance model atti- attached to identity, compliance, and confidentiality, addressing, they say, a lot of the challenges that are associated with regulated assets on-chain. So this is both a new technology provider as well as a new bond issuance out of Hong Kong, folks. Interesting. Very, very interesting to see. And uh, going into my first article here, I have Noble. Noble collaborates with Hashnote, and they're launching tokenized real-world asset products on the Cosmos ecosystem. So yet another blockchain ecosystem that we've got involved in the industry. Their first product is going to be the USYC token, which you've heard it here first. You may have never heard of this type of product before. It is a short-term duration yield fund focused on Whoa. U.S. Treasury bills. <laughs> so we have another competitor to this market. Um, Noble is responsible for the native asset and issuance uh, using the Circle USDC stablecoin amongst Cosmos's ecosystem, and they are bringing more tokenized securities to market. But again, it's a product that I think we've seen and heard from a few times now. And so it's great to use USDC as their settlement layer, Cosmos, a new different blockchain, and showing the world about their inter-blockchain communication protocol, which is building for real-world asset interoperability, which is something pretty cool to see. So that's the, the first one that I've got launching a new product. Well, a, a similar product, but a certainly <laughs> new one coming from Cosmos. New one for them and a, a new treasury product on Cosmos. Uh, I think that adds yet another chain to the list of treasuries being supported on, on different blockchains. But Cosmos, not necessarily new to the game. They've actually been quite a while doing tokenization, right, guys? It's just I, I, thought, I don't remember – Maybe I, I'm missing some headlines from last year, but they certainly didn't make too much of an impression. Glad to see that they are coming back now uh, with this Treasuries play. Uh, I think that's very cool. Also, of course, using USDC, the more these little tiny differentiators of uh, features in crypto, it's what matters to the end user. So uh, we'll see how they do in, in comparison to all the other uh, options that are out there. Yeah, I think that's a good point too with respect to – you see on all these different blockchains, the, the term TVL being thrown around, total value locked. And that essentially just refers to how many assets, how much value is on that blockchain. And so because of that, if you have a high TVL, if you've got billions of dollars on chain, that specific blockchain also needs these products, right? So at least they're not right. launching the same product on a existing blockchain that already has a competitive product, but there are, I'm sure, a lot of investors on Cosmos that are looking for yield-bearing assets that are more stable, that they maybe don't want to lock in a lending account that could potentially collapse like we've seen across the industry over the last couple of years. Instead, you can put it in the treasury, still get that few percent on uh, return on your asset, knowing that it's backed by something that's a little bit more secure. Makes little sense to me. That's uh, again, treasuries are a big one that came up last year. We saw multiple issuances. So, you guys covered that real well. Next up on the news here, we have DwellFi. They are partnering up with Shihan Securities out of uh, South Korea. Uh, Shihan Securities being a brokerage and investment banking firm. And the idea is like we covered on previous piece of news in the token debrief. The idea is to create exposure for the U.S. investors to have exposure over on the APEC side and vice versa, APEC investors down to the U.S. So they'll be helping each other out with um, expanding their markets, understanding, you know, what uh, securities are best in each of their regions based on investor appetite um, and developing those as uh, you know together, as well as uh, also on the regulatory side, understanding each one's, you know, like, hey, what can and can't we do compliantly both in South Korea and the United States? So all great things to see for future tokenized securities between the two, Dwellify and Shinhan, uh, coming up. Interesting. I've said it before. You know, last year I called it. You know, South Korea is coming. They're coming out the gate hot. They may have been the, the slowest in comparison to many other uh, jurisdictions in the APAC region and compared to the, to the U.S. and, the, and Europe, but – uh, they have, you know, what they call second movers advantage, right? They've seen the playbook. They've seen what works. They're coming out fast. They're organizing fast. They're now issuing tokens. Uh, can't wait to see what else South Korea comes up with 
this year, but specifically great uh, news from Dwalfi and Shinhan. Hmm. And real quick, guys, I kind of just want to show this graph from the Q3 report of our state of security tokens, because it kind of just shows specifically on issuances related to bonds, um, how the APAC region is really killing it. Um, so that's just related to this well five news, as well as the first one that you covered, um, Herwig, I believe, over in, uh, you know, in the previous segment. So again, just, you know, keep an eye out for what's to come, and I'm sure we'll have an updated version yeah, I, I think the market has been sort of always split the way that we've looked at it between the U.S. and what's happening here and collectively everywhere else. Uh, but I think we might have to start tracking volumes based on you know, APAC Europe and, and <clears throat> the U.S. at the very least, because I think we're going to start to see some domination from the other hemisphere there. Mm. Um, moving on, we are going to go over to Europe, where one of Germany's largest fund providers, DECA Investments, has announced that they have tokenized. So DECA Bank um, actually founded their own solution. They call it SWIAT, S-W-I-A-T, SWIAT. Uh, and it also includes backers like Standard Charters, SC Ventures, as well as LBBW. So those are major, major institutions. Um, and they created their own decentralized financial market infrastructure, DFMI, uh, they tokenized shares in their A Deca blockchain EINS fund, <laughs> um, which you can kind of gather probably what it is for. Um, it, it plans to trial a redemption uh, when the time comes in order to show that technology off. And depending on how it goes, uh, it actually intends to they intend to tokenize a mutual fund uh, afterwards. So one of the benefits that they recognize is, of course, uh, identifying that there are fewer intermediaries involved to do an issuance like this. Uh, and in this case, DECA Bank is also the depository and the custodian, given that they're also you know, bank licensed to do that stuff. So it's worth mentioning that this may be new to many of you, the SWIAT blockchain, but it was used to issue digital bearer bonds, they say, and digital register bonds previously since May, 2023 by several German savings banks. Cool moves uh, from DECA, uh, in Germany, guys, what do you think? That's really interesting. I, I think it makes total sense across the board that they are building their own different solutions here. They're working with some banks in Germany, which we've seen Germany being a, a really high activity country and jurisdiction for tokenization, which is exciting to see just another rival country that's getting involved in a big way. Yeah, didn't didn't um, Bitbomb do like a billion dollar bomb back in in a few years ago already? Right? Germany is yeah. definitely on fire, and now Bush Bush has been super active as well Bush across Bush super all active products yeah. and solutions. Great to see Deca onto the scene, yet another major player making moves. And so, I guess if Jason, you don't have any other thoughts, I can go right into the next one here which is MAV. It's a non-custodial decentralized exchange, and they have partnered with BACT, which is doing real-world asset tokenization. So what they're trying to do is build a RWA real-world asset pool on the MAV DEX so that BACT's B, I think it's blb one token, which represents a, a treasury bond, believe it or not, one year ETF, they actually launched this product and they're building a liquidity pool behind it for in investors and issuers to be able to capitalize. Remember, you could invest in the product itself, which would get you that yield on the treasury product, or you could provide liquidity to the pool of that yield bearing product. And what you're getting there in yield is actually a percentage of the trading fees that are associated with that product, as well as you have the impermanent loss or gain depending on which side of the equation you're on but presumably as a provider you may take a little bit of a loss but at least with a product like this since the price shouldn't change significantly that's not as much of a concern so basically you're betting on volume by providing the liquidity pool versus you're betting on the consistency of the cash flowing dividend if you buy the actual product and then obviously if you are providing liquidity into the pool you need to own pieces of both sides of the asset so you are in theory, still going to be generating some level of yield from the actually 50% or whichever of the, you know, treasury product that you actually own. So pretty cool to see. This is 
not a U.S. sanctioned product, but it is a decentralized exchange. So it is, I believe, permissionless with respect to who can get access to this. So very interesting to see a fully compliant decentralized exchange, as they call it. I'm not exactly sure the standards on how you measure compliance with respect to a decentralized exchange, but their their uh, their intentions are good and they have a very cool product and, and provided that they can make it work, it, uh, it makes a lot of sense. As we talked about earlier with these treasury products, I think the biggest interest for crypto people in treasury products is I don't trust the staking services I'm working with. I'd rather buy a treasury product that's going to spit me off a similar yield as some of these, you know, staking services without a lot of the risk of default like we've seen from Genesis or or Celsius or BlockFi or any of the guys that have have collapsed due to uh, some of the uh, you know lack of risk mitigation strategies. So that's that's mob and backed. Pretty cool to see. Yeah, I was actually going to bring up that exact point on compliance and like it's DAX, but it's <laughs> supposedly fully compliant so uh but again it, people in those regions are at least comfortable launching things like these uh you know delving and combining you know traditional securities with um DeFi protocols and get to leverage some of these cool things that maybe in the u.s were just not as comfortable using so for them i applaud them you know it's cool like, you know you're exploring new uh frontiers here uh, so good for both mob and bat yeah uh i think you guys both made great points uh, the reality is you can make it happen in a compliant way. We've seen Realty already leverage Levin Swap, and in the past they had worked with Uniswap. Uh, so you can make a sort of permission environment. It would be interesting to find out if they have a jurisdiction or a structure that they think is compliant where it's completely permissionless. Uh, but given that this is tied to you know uh, U.S. securities, uh, specifically the iShares, you know, I, I think there's probably some level of permission uh, environment that came together here. Uh, and so I think that's great. I think this is the future of finance that you're going to need both in the beginning. But when you can get DEXs big enough and you can get uh, lending protocols big enough, these will offer new solutions that don't require an immediate counterparty to be a human on the other side or through a a company or firm that does it, you can go to a DeFi protocol that is indeed compliant. So I'm excited for that future. I hope this is indeed the case coming to life right here in front of our eyes with Bact uh, and Moth. And with that, I think that is all of the market movements this week. So we can go ahead and finish the show, Kyle, with our favorite companies. All right. Well, company of the week, Herwig, maybe the most prestigious award <laughs> in the security token industry outside of only the company of the year award, which we also give at the end of the year only to a company that won company of the week in one of our 50 plus episodes each year. We've seen T0 win the award, JP Morgan win the award, INX Republic winning companies of the year and hundreds of other businesses that have been recognized for their achievements, accomplishments throughout each week of our 221 and counting episodes. This is my favorite segment of the week, Herwig, and I have been dying as I've listened to you regale us about the amazing news coming out of the industry to hear who is your company of the week for this episode. Kyle, I mean, I think you're you're dying to get it out. So why don't you start? <laughs> well, my company of the week is Deca Investments. Nice. So we talked about them earlier here in the show. They're based out of Germany. They're one of the largest fund providers in Germany, and they are they built the you know the CWAT platform and blockchain, and they're doing decentralized financial market infrastructure. So we're throwing out DeFi and going with DFMI. <laughs> Decentralized Financial Market Infrastructure, DFMI. DFMI. And they're backed by Standard Charters, SC Ventures, as well as other firms. They're doing tokenized shares in their blockchain fund. And I also think it's cool because they're trialing redemptions as well. So they're exploring what that looks like. And they're working on potentially bringing mutual funds on chain as well. So for all of those reasons, I certainly don't need to highlight them all because we just covered them a couple of minutes ago. Deca Bank is my winner. Kyle, what a great choice. You know, I personally had not even heard of them 
up until this point, which I, I take personally, but that's on me. Uh, I think they absolutely deserve the company of the week. That's huge. They have a whole infrastructure. They're not some startup either. Uh, they've got a lot of licenses, history, track record, trust. Uh, and now it sounds like they've got the technology. Excited to see what else they bring to market this year. Uh, Kyle, I got to tell you, mine's pretty competitive to that, I think, because I gave my company of the week to Signum. You know, oh. so, ah, it, was, it was so tough. I'm not going to lie. I also considered it to Taurus because it is a big deal to be able to get a FINMA license to trade securities to retail and launch a marketplace. But Signum, folks, nearly being a unicorn, raising uh, $40 million oversubscribed to put into their war chest, which they say will go towards expanding the company, expanding their presence and jurisdictions, which means we're going to see them grow even bigger. Uh, I think this means that this year, uh, they're going to put themselves in running for company of the year, not just by winning this week, but because they're going to do a lot with that money. I'm excited to see what they're going to bring to market, who they work with specifically, uh, and of course, the new technology that they continue to build uh, and bring to market. So for all of those reasons, Kyle, this week, my company of the week is Signum. Makes total sense. I was impressed to see how much money they've been able to raise their valuation and how successful the company's been we've been covering signum now for years they've been in this industry for for quite some time continuing to plug away driving significant value to the ecosystem this is a, a great winner all i can tell you is kyle i feel like last year which wasn't that far away so it's still easy to remember uh, we didn't see a whole lot of funding activity, did we? The ones that we did see weren't exactly sexy or undisclosed amounts. And now we're starting to see unicorn like figures again. We're seeing mega, mega million dollar rounds. Feeling pretty good about that, huh? Nature is healing her wig just as we knew it would. As we knew it would. And with that, we are going to end our show uh, we hope you enjoyed. As always, we appreciate your feedback. In the meantime, while you're missing us till next Monday, be sure to catch us over at stm.co for all your latest news, all your latest trading data. We're your price discovery tool for the RWA space. Please come check us out. Of course, give us a like and a share. Uh, and with that, we hope to catch you again. Happy tokenizing. Mm -hmm.